development activities. And, you know, the Millennium Development Goals have progressed and, and you know, I, I think that there's been some success and, and some challenges. And, if, you know, at the end of the Millennium Development Goals, as, as I think all of you probably know, we came out with the Sustainable Development Goals. And what's really interesting is the way partnerships with the private sector are now framed. Um, you know, just to take a small quote, a successful sustainable development agenda requires partnerships between government, the private sector, and civil society. Urgent action is needed to mobilize, redirect, and unlock the transformative power of trillions of dollars of resources to deliver on sustainable development goals. And, and what you're seeing is a, is a significant change, at least in words, in how the development community is thinking about partnerships with the private sector. And I think the argument that we can make is that you know, business or market-based approaches aren't necessarily better than donation, but they're a complement. And we, we may want to adjust the balance in some sense and have a little bit more of those resources directed towards facilitating um, business solutions. And that's sort of been the logic, and I've been involved with, with this idea of base of the pyramid um, you know, for a long time. I actually started in, in Malawi in, in 1989, and then um, I've been engaged, I guess, coming on 30 years. And, and, and the big idea is that business alone and development alone haven't really been able to crack the code, to figure out how to create a sustained impact on alleviating poverty. But in some sense, what they're beginning to see is a way to work together, or at least an opportunity to work together. And the logic is, is pretty clear, that you've got companies always looking for growth. You know, this idea if we have to find new customers, locate new sources of supply, create value, and the question always is, where are the new opportunities? And you would argue the development community, I think their biggest challenge is scale, um, and having, if you will, too many customers. You know, you, depending on how you count it, there are four or five billion people in poverty and that number is only going to grow you know, in, in the coming decades. And the, the question that I think development has to ask itself and is asking itself is, when we're running a project, what happens when, when the money runs out? What will be left? And we need projects, activities, initiatives that can not only sustain themselves, but actually scale. And that's actually what business is pretty good at. Um, so maybe there's real logic for this. And, and the other half of the logic is, you know, the development community wants to alleviate poverty, but if you alleviate poverty, what you're actually doing is creating value. Right? Poverty alleviation is, is, is about creating value, and that's what businesses are good at. So this idea of alleviating poverty isn't such a foreign idea if you think about it as a, as a source of value creation. And our aspiration has been that we want to create sustainable, scalable enterprises that truly alleviate, excuse me, <clears throat> that truly alleviate poverty. And, and, you know, to be frank, we've had mixed success. Um, and, and that, you know, is we have to deliver sooner rather than later. We've had some success, but we need more. And that's sort of where, where I want to talk a little bit about that, you know, the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the conversation has changed. Business is now part of the solution. Um, and the interest, the level of interest is tremendous. We used to hold events, you know, 15 years ago when this idea of base of the pyramid was just coming out, um, and you know, we, we thought we'd, we got pretty much everyone in the world, and it could barely fill a room. Um, so I think that the, the growth is there. We're unlocking new resources. Certainly the, the growth of, of impact investing highlights that. Um, that in, in, in just one example of how much more interest and resources are there. And then we see that this at the University of Michigan, but I suspect other, others of you see this as well, that, that we're seeing more and more very smart, dedicated, hardworking people interested in, in committing their careers to this. And that's really exciting. And finally, we're seeing a lot of ventures being launched, no doubt about that. But we've had min, mixed venture success, and in some respects, that's not so surprising and because, you know, if you, I'm in Germany today, but if you launch ventures in Germany or in the United States, um, you you certainly wouldn't expect 100% success rate. You might expect you know, 20, 30, 40%, uh, if, depending on how you count success. Um, so we've had mixed venture success, but I would say that our biggest challenge is we haven't had enough success still, particularly at scale. And you know, again, we I don't think we lack pilots. 
Um, and, and I think one of the challenges we face is a lot of ventures are launched with the goal of being a successful pilot, not with the goal of being a scalable enterprise. And, and this has implications for how they build their partnership network. We've had a lot of activity, but we haven't really understood very well yet what drives performance. How do we explain the variation in performance of different inclusive businesses? And we've had a lot of cases and reports and anecdotes, but those tend to really be focused on, if you will, creating excitement and engagement about what's going on rather than really diving in and thinking about the lessons learned. So a lot of the stories, almost all the stories you hear are about success. And we also have to understand failure or less success to really understand best practices. So I think those are some of the gaps. And, and that's you know where we're focusing on. And in some respects, it leads to, I think, reframing four key things. And, and one is, um, I think we have to stop moving from, should we do this? And, and you know, you, you are, I'm around a lot of people that they, they want to know that everything's going to be great before they start. And I, we can't promise that. And what we have to really focus on is how can we do this better? And, and this, you know, it sounds simple, but when you're worried about should we do it, you know, you're not taking action, you're frozen, you're waiting for something to, to tell you this is the perfect time. You know, we're still, we still need to learn, we still need to innovate, and we need to move forward and expect that we are not going to be successful in everything we do. And that has to be part of the plan. That, you know, Success is good, but failure can also be a great way to learn, and we need to focus on that. You know, one of the things I say is, you know, some people debate whether inclusive business is, is good or bad for the poor, and, and um, yeah, I, I think that's an interesting and important question, but it's actually the wrong question. Even if we said inclusive business or business is bad for the poor, business isn't going to stop serving the poor. Um, you know, it already does in many ways. It, it just doesn't serve them well. The consumers pay more, they, they have difficult access to low quality products, producers face a very opaque market where they very rarely get a fair deal on their on their produce and most of that's captured by the intermediary. So business does serve the poor. We need to make it serve it better. And then the second one is we need to move from an inspiring stories of success to understanding variation in performance including failures. And and for me, I, I, I am, I when we host events, we don't allow speakers to come and tell everyone how great they're doing. We want speakers to come and tell us what they've learned on their journey, where they're struggling, what are the challenge points, and I think that's where learning happens. That's where we can begin to understand more about, about moving forward. And then again, I mentioned this earlier, that, that our goal is, I think it has to be scale. Now, small is beautiful, so I'm not opposed to small by any means, but what's attracted a market-based approach is the idea that we need to serve billions. And if all of our examples are about serving 100 or 1,000 or 20,000, it doesn't show a path to scale. Um, but scale is possible. Um, and I will, I will say that, that, that probably the best example of scale is, is mobile telephony, where if you go back to the, the, the beginning of the, or the turn of the century, you know, half the people in the world hadn't made a phone call. And now what you see is you know, growth in mobile is 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 everywhere, you know. But the argument back then was, you know, the poor can't afford, afford phones. They won't know how to use the technology. And it, if they got a phone, who would they call anyways? Because no one else has phones that they would want to talk to. So, you know, some of the same arguments we might make about the challenges for other enterprises existed for, for mobile telephony. Now it's it, it certainly scaled everywhere. So its scale is possible, but again, the goal has to be scale, not not just seeking to pilot. And then finally, you know, where we're going to focus on is one of the things that, that we've done in the world, and, you know, I'm in a business school, we spend a lot of time thinking about what drives performance and what are the tools and frameworks and strategies businesses can use to execute better. And we, you know, we have Porter's Five Forces, we have the four P's of marketing, we have, um, you know, SWAT, we have all kinds of tools that we can use, and they are standardized tools that can then be customized by any enterprise. And I think that's what we need to build now for, for inclusive businesses. And, and some people say, well, every inclusive business market is different. It's a different geography. It could be a different customer segment. Well, that, that's also true in, in that sense in the developed world, that every market is different as well. 
Um, every sector is different, but you know we can use the five forces in in Europe, and we can use it in 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 the U.S. and we can use it for pharmaceuticals and we can use it for consumer goods. So what, what we can create standardized tools that are then enterprises can then customize to their local context. And um, you know, briefly, um, uh, you know, I have a new book out, and and um, that's really the focus of the book is really this idea that we've seen the promise of sustainable, scalable impact enterprises, but we have to do more to truly deliver on that promise. We must continue to draw lessons from the experiences, the successes and frustrations of enterprises operating in the field and identify what works and what doesn't. And that's, you know, that's a lead in um, to the work that, that uh, we've done with, with Ivon. It's really taking that philosophy and saying, you know, we need to understand more deeply lessons learned and, and develop practical, applicable tools, frameworks, processes to do that. And, you know, within the, this book, you know, I've, there's work on thinking about how you, how you design, your, how you set yourself up for success. What are the things you need to do to make sure you're ready? You know, the, what's the team look like? What do the metrics look like? The resources. And then as David has mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit more in September about the next one, which is how do you actually plan for scale as an enterprise? How do you think about the capabilities you need to actually proactively build? Um, how do you think about um, strategies for piloting to get the outcomes you need? And then for those of you who know me, I've spent a lot of work trying to understand value creation. And you know, if we're going to work with the base of the pyramid, we darn well better understand the impacts on them. And, and linking alleviating poverty to, to building a robust value proposition. And then the final one is, is the partnership ecosystem, which is what I want to talk about for the rest of our time together, which I think is so crucial. Um, and, and, it, and it starts kind of with this, I think, this trap that a lot of enterprises and, and I would say development community fall into. You know, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And, and this, isn't, this is um, not my saying, of course. And if you go into the Johannes Airport, you'll, you'll find it painted on the wall. But I think it's a really important way of thinking about it. You know, people tend to rush to failure. It takes too long, it's hard, it's complicated, but it has to be done. And if you really want to go somewhere, you have to invest in doing it. And I think a new partnership approach is required to, to do this. And I think th th this is the question that a lot of people start with. Who should we partner with? And while I think it's a, it's a fine and important question, I feel it also sends us down the wrong path. And, and, I, and a better question is, how can we create a partnership ecosystem? And here, rather than thinking about the one funder we need, you know, the one partner we need, we begin to think about the entire set. And we're thinking about that from the very beginning. And it's not a sequential model where we get one, well, maybe we need another. And it's not a, um, a reactive model where we're, well, we're trying to get funding and we heard about, you know, sort of this incubator, or this challenge fund, so we'll go after it. It's really thinking about if I'm going to reach scale, who are the partners I need to engage? What are the what are the capability gaps that I must fill to achieve that? And you know, this sort of highlights this next slide, kind of what, what I've talked about. Um, that I think enterprises in this space not only need to build their ventures, the enterprise leaders, but they also need to create the markets around the ventures. And if they're not thinking about that, then you can imagine, you know, things like clean water, clean cooks, so, so many. You know, you could sort of say, well, well, of course, people want to drink clean water, but there isn't necessarily a market. There isn't necessarily demand. It's a hard sell to convince people to change what they've always done all their life to drink something that probably looks almost exactly the same. Dirty water isn't necessarily dirty in color. And the value proposition that you're offering them is if you drink this, you know, if all works well, nothing happens. So if you, if you use my product, nothing happens. Um, that's a that's a tough sell. So you know you have to think about how do you create the markets around it, and then how do you reach scale? And then you know I, again I think a lot of people are motivated primarily by saying if we get funding that's all we need, and that the partnership discovery is often not considered strategically important. And that, you know in fact the enterprises aren't even aware of the landscape of partners, which is actually pretty complicated. There are actually a fair number of organizations doing a lot of different things, and you know, they're impact investors, they're incubators, they're challenge funds, just to name a few. And even within these models, like impact investors, they all do different things. And incubators, they do different things. So how, if you're an enterprise manager, do you look out or look up and around and say, okay, 
there are actually a lot of partners. How do I begin to think about a partnership strategy? And what we developed was something we called a, the, the partnership ecosystem framework. And the idea here is to provide a way of thinking about the landscape. And it divides it in a couple of ways. One is, you know, as I mentioned before, we need to think about investments that are really focused on building the enterprise itself. You can see some typical examples. But we also have to think about how is the market going to be created around this enterprise? And then we need to think about there are some things we need to do just to make things happen immediately to enable action. And there are some things we need to do that are longer term that are really about building capacity. And you could begin to see that this leads into four quadrants that are all areas that an enterprise should be thinking about. Now, you know, you know, each enterprise will be a little different. This is a tool that allows you, I mean, what it really does is make sure that, you know, well, let me turn this around and say, you don't know what you don't know. And this helps enterprise leaders begin to think about what is the possibilities for a partnership ecosystem. Then you have to customize it. You begin to think about, well, what am I good at? So I don't need a partner for what isn't necessarily needed in my current model and what's left and what's left is where you have to begin to think about can I build partners to help me do it because if I do everything myself in an environment which is constrained in terms of the market itself and you know, infrastructure and all the other things we know about and also constrained in the consumer base in terms of having limited resources. You have a constrained market, a constrained consumer base. It's very, very hard for enterprises to do all of this on their own and to absorb all the costs. So how can we build a robust partnership model? So to ask some questions that are starting to come in, um, when looking at uh, the partnership ecosystem framework, you just said that, that it's important to customize it to your context, to your business model. Um, so how do enterprises really assess their partnership ecosystem with uh, the framework, are there any guiding questions throughout the quadrants available or is it always a very um, specific context that cannot be um, put into such a general um, framework? No, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and it, you know, so the idea of the framework itself is to take the first step, is to organize a landscape. The question then is what do you do? And you know, what in a broad sense we've developed um, an approach that begins to, to work enterprises through this and, and it's at a high level it's what I mentioned earlier it's beginning to think about broadly what are all the things successful to go to scale in this case um, what is it that you are already good at and then what are the gaps that you need to fill and how do you go about building a, a network to do that and one of the things we're beginning to learn is it looks like for enterprises there are probably a few things that all enterprises are probably going to be looking for partners or a vast majority across sectors. And then there are going to be some that are much more sector specific and that's what we're trying to do now and this is the great work we're, do, we're doing with Ivan is beginning to understand and give enterprise managers more insight so they're not looking at this going I wonder what to do. They can say well look if you're going to be operating in, in ag or in, in say clean water you know, I've got to have a partner, I've got to think about demand creation and it's so expensive that this is probably something I really have to think about from the get-go. So we want to build that knowledge base and that's sort of the next step in this work of really understanding what drives successful performance is to take a framework and say how does it, how can it be customized to different sectors, to different enterprises and we're beginning to do that but you know that's, we're beginning that journey and you know and I think that's a journey we all have to take because what we have to do is create tools that make it easier for enterprises to be successful, that aggregate what we've learned already. Um, I see that we have a few questions coming in of which uh, one is very specific, so I'll address it uh, in the second step. And uh, there's another question, Ted, do you know of any good database which maps the different existing partners and their activities so we can conduct this exercise? Yeah. And, and, and there are starting to be some. I don't know that there are any. We're starting to see. I know that IBON is working with the, part, the, the practitioner hub to begin to develop um, that kind of database and make it a sortable database. And I think that becomes very powerful. So I think we're not there yet. So there's, there's something in that there are some databases. You can probably do some Google searches. 
but probably part of this is you, you're just going to have to start getting in and getting engaged and getting networked. And I'm going to I'm going to steal something that that I'm going to talk about later, but I'll say it now that I think to be successful, and we found this in the study as well, that an enterprise needs to have someone who's dedicated to building a partnership ecosystem. Now, if it's a small business, a small enterprise, that may not be a full-time person, but it needs to be a role that's embedded in part of the key leadership because if you don't do it and you don't focus on it, it does revert back to being much more reactive. And that person has to be able to understand that question. How do I find out about the ecosystem for this enterprise in this context? How do I make these conversations? How do I really understand the value proposition that they are looking for, especially when it extends beyond just financing? Because if you look at this framework, a lot of people wind up in the enhanced enterprise resources in the financial capital bucket. And they say, well, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to be focused on getting money and they miss all the other pieces that they actually, when you think about it, they need, you know, they need market intelligence, they need access, you know, last mile distribution, it could be market creation, they may need support in, in sort of building out some piece of the value chain or, th or the legal infrastructure. And if they think about scale especially, they know those pieces need to be filled. You need to start thinking about, if I can't do this, who can help me do it? And, you know, having a person on board that's really focused on that can do it. And then having resources like this, this new partnership or the new practitioner of IBON connection around beginning to sort so that you can take a first cut at this. But, you know, these are all steps in the right direction. Um, I think the second one is a little bit, uh, it's a longer question, but I, you can maybe try to find a short answer. How would you define partnership? We are grappling with this question in Connect to Grow. We are seeking to encourage partnerships between Indian enterprises and enterprises in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The thesis is that Indian companies can provide an innovation to the African companies enter and grow markets. Um, we don't want to develop supplier by relationships, but work with each party to develop a value proposition, which utilizes skills and resources to introduce something new to a market. Um, so uh, for Daniel, who was asking this, um, uh, it would speak to the fourth quadrant, um, but he would like to see and hear your uh, thoughts on this. Yeah, and it's 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 an, it's a it's a long question. It feels like it kind of uh, there's a little bit of the answer in, in itself, and I think there are probably two broad types of partnerships. One that's that it's really about a transaction. You know, you're you're buying something from a supplier. So yes, they're part your partner, part of the value chain, but there's no sort of shared ownership of the of the enterprise, and there's no, um, if you will, subsidized support. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about here is beginning to think about: Are these partners working together towards a common good, where they're both invested in the success of the enterprise? Um, I want to shy away from a, a, an exact definition of a partnership, but I think some of the things that were mentioned by Danielle are right. You know, it's it's this idea of of sharing. It's 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 a shared vision to some degree of doing this and in, in some respects it is about partners investing in things that the enterprise can't afford to do themselves so it, it, it moves it, it doesn't exclude that it moves away solely from a, a transaction where you know you're buying parts or supplies from another company um, a last one before we go into the second part of the presentation um, someone is asking how relevant this framework is for a startup uh, um, organization like Small Farmers Organization or Association? I mean, th well, I, there's, I, I, that's, I, I, you would expect me to say absolutely crucial. Um, it, it is. I think that if, if you're not thinking about the partners you need to get started and how that evolves in scale, you're not going to get to scale. And you may not even succeed in pilot if you're not really thinking about, you know, I need to, to launch something. You know, if it's, it's farmers, at some point you're going to bump into issues of infrastructure. How am I going to take care of that when I go to scale? What's going to happen? You know, financing. How am I going to, um, and I don't know the model exactly, but how am I going to ensure that the proper inputs are made available? Um, how am I going to ensure that if I'm increasing supply, you know, farmers are producing more wheat, that there's also an increase in demand. 
so that you don't have a you know the sense of I'm increasing supply, demand is the same, therefore prices go down. And you you have to begin to think about that at an early stage. Now maybe more informal and, and simpler, and I think that's true at an early stage, but I think it's it's really important to do and if you start thinking about going to scale and the partners you need, um, you be on that journey already. You don't want to get to the end of your pilot, then say, well, it's time to go to scale. Oh, who should I partner with now? Um, I think that has to be part of the, the process as you go through the piloting to begin to think about the scale. Because you know, the last bit of the, this, this um, idea is that the partnerships you create in pilot may not be the right partnerships for scale. So how do you think about this as a robust and evolving ecosystem of partners? And it's a great question, but I think that it, it, it is something that needs to be done regardless of where you are in the process. Because in the end, the goal is, you know, whatever scale means to you, the goal is sustainable and, and, and enterprise that has some scale. More questions? Uh, there's one more. I don't know if we want to... Uh, one, we do one more and then... One more. Um, I don't see a question mark, so I hope it is a question nonetheless. Generally, smallholders have sold their produce immediately after harvest, and that time rate of produce, low and business partners want to purchase their produce. In that case, how can we assure benefit to small farmers? Yeah, I mean, and I think I understand the question, but what, what it feels like is the farmer doesn't have any options in terms of who they can sell to. And if, if I'm understanding that correctly, we, we've seen some models which create a more transparent uh, process and they often will involve an off-taker who if you can meet the sufficient demand will guarantee a price and it doesn't guarantee that the farmer has to sell but it does give them options to sell into and you're seeing some models like ITC Chopal in India hmm. that have begun to implement that um, in some very interesting ways. <laughs> well, let me let me move on um, and then we'll have should have a few minutes at the end for some final questions but you know one of the things that, that we've talked about is is Really, if you're an enterprise, you know, how do you begin to prioritize, organize, sort through your partners? Who should you partner with? Um, and can we begin to understand that? And then once you've begun to, to do that, it's, it's easy to say we should have these partnerships. Then the next harder part is how do you actually pull it off? So how do you develop relationships to maximize their effectiveness? So you know, we collaborated with the Inclusive Business Action Network because they are very, very interested in this idea of partnerships and, and helping to catalyze leadership in terms of what's the next level of questions we need to build, both for partnerships among the development community, but also how does the development community ensure that the right set of partners are available to enterprises. So this is again the partnership ecosystem framework and this is kind of the study of who and what we did is is we um, spent significant time with 14 different enterprises, agricultural enterprises in East Africa and looked at, tried to have some variation. So some were um, providing services such as uh, inputs to farmers and others were sourcing, in other words, buying from the farmers. So it was both a kind of a selling to and a buying from in the ag side. Some of these were entrepreneurial and, and some were corporate. And then what we were looking at is, is two measures of success. And one was, did they actually create a, a, a viable business model that could go to scale? And then the second was actually how much engagement did they wind up having with smallholder farmers? And some of these, th these enterprises all started with the aspiration of working with smallholder farmers, but some didn't necessarily wind up that way. They ended up moving up market for one reason or another. So they may have built a robust business model. But when you get right down to it, it had very little uh, engagement with smallholder farmers. So we wanted to take a look and understand what was going on there. And what we did is we rated their, their partnership ecosystem in each of the four quadrants, which are the last four columns that, that you'll see there. They're, they're the abbreviations for the four quadrants and trying to understand again what was predicting performance. How was a partnership ecosystem predicting performance? You know what we came up with overall and uh, um, I guess not too surprising given our train of thought but you know very reassuring was that you know the stronger overall partnership ecosystem increased the probability of successful pilots uh, in terms of both validating the business model and engaging smallholder farmers. So the more these enterprises were both, you know, thinking about each of the quadrants and the partners that they needed. 
the, the better off they seem to be able to do. And what we found in general was, interestingly enough, that the, this, this upper left hand quadrant, the facilitating enterprise activity, was the, had the strongest association with this. So it was really, at this stage, it, more than money, it was the ability to build a network of partners that allowed access to farmers on the ground. It allowed them to act, it could be aggregating demand, it could be you know, facilitating inputs, but that became the key component. Um, and then um, together, if they were able to also get resources, um, the, the enhancing enterprise resources, that, that had implications for the business model, but not so much for engagement of, of smallholders. What we saw often is if they got a lot of resources um, in the EER, quadrant but failed in the upper left, the business model would work, but the engagement with the smallholders wasn't very successful. Not, not meaning the business wasn't successful, but they ended up moving up market to, with the farmers they worked with. And then what we also saw, which is interesting, was that there were variations. Um, and for some, in this case, um, uh, for those that are sourcing in, in terms of buying from the base of the pyramid, partnerships in the, in the upper right, the market creation, were, tended to be more important than those that were servicing, which was interesting for us to see. And, and it, it begins to suggest that within sectors there are some priority partnerships, and then even within a sector there can be a variation. And we saw that again in the second one where, in general, corporates had less partners than entrepreneurial ventures and they tended to be less successful. So kind of an interesting thought that we haven't, we think we know the answers, we can talk about if there's some questions, but again, um, it, it does suggest in some level that, that you know, different organizational structures may require different partnership portfolios as well. And then this, the, the next stage was the, is there a question? Yeah, there was um, one question yeah. with respect to what you just mentioned, that um, corporate initiatives, um, compared to the entrepreneurial ones, had fewer partners across all sectors and were less successful. So there is a question if you also found a difference in what type of partners they had, or each one of them. So is there any tendency also discovered there? That's a great question, and I don't have the answer to that. It's, you know, I think we might be able to look back and, and find out, but um, offhand, what we tried to do was um, we organized them by the, the resources they were providing mm -hmm. and less so about the type of the partner. So it's, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that though. Uh, I, I think for corporations, the, there's, there's two challenges. One is corporations are more used to doing things on their own. And for the development community, they seem to be, it seems for them to be easier to invest in startups than it is in corporations for a variety of reasons. So that there may be sort of some artifacts that are embedded in this that, that sort of lead to that. But that just because that's the way it is, isn't the way it should be. Right. And I think both yeah, of them yeah. really have to think about this. Definitely. All right. And then the, the next was, okay, so now we're beginning to understand what type of an ecosystem needs to be to be created. Then of course the question is is how? And I've sort of given this away. Um, but what we did is we we spent some significant time with a subset of these enterprises really looking at their efforts at building partnership relationships and ecosystems and trying to understand what led one organization, one enterprise to be more successful than another. Um, and you know our findings came out and, and again this, this would have been a surprise if I hadn't mentioned it but this idea of actually having an individual who is dedicated to this effort. And, and, and in some respects, you say, of course, but if you look at most enterprise, and, and the term that I've used, and, and you can pick any term you want, is, is a chief ecosystem director. Someone who's part of their job responsibilities actually to organize that ecosystem. Is there someone in place at the top management team that owns that responsibility? And if it's not, I think the enterprise is going to be in trouble. Um, and, and part of it is is the person, and then the next piece is you know it's not just any person. Um, they have to. You know, one of the things you you see is enterprise saying, "I I don't understand the development community. They they don't get me. I don't know how to talk to them." And and the challenge is for the enterprises, they need to get the development community. They need to understand what drives the value proposition for the development community for nonprofits. And they have to be able to, and they can, but they have to be able to frame their value proposition in a way 
that makes sense to the development community, that helps the development community, the nonprofits achieve their goals. And that's a skill. And you know, we you know, some people talk about multilingual being I can speak you know Spanish and German and and Sichuan and you know, uh, 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 any other language you can think of. And I think of multilingual as as um, as being able to speak the language of business, of nonprofits, of the development community, and actually be able to translate across that. And that's that's a skill. Um, and then, you know, among other things, the, the CED has to really recognize that this is a, a dynamic partnership. And that the partners you start with, especially at the early stages, are unlikely to be the partners you wind up with if you get to scale. Many things change when you go to scale, including risk, um, the scope of the investment, uh, all kinds of things, the geographic knowledge. So how do you make sure that you are both adding the right partners and exiting from some of your, maybe your friends and your long-term partners, but they may no longer be needed or they may actually be become an anchor if you keep them too long. So how do you make sure that you're, you're really thinking about that? So, you know, at the high level, and we have this report available, um, and I think we can make it available to anyone that, that's listening if you request it. So I don't want to go into all the details, but, you know, the big, the big takeaways is that, you know, building a purpose partnership ecosystem is key to success, but the universe of, of partners is large and diverse and, and optimizing that is, you know, not only having, um, not only thinking about what do I need to do for venture development, but also thinking about how do I build the market around me? How do I make sure that all the pieces are in place? And even if it's about building an ecosystem that other enterprises would benefit from, it still needs to have partners be engaged to do that. How does that happen? How's that going to happen? And then, you know, I think to make it happen, you need to have senior level effort. It needs to be a core part of strategy. You know, the development community is unfamiliar goals and ways of thinking. How do you transcend that? How do you make sure that everyone's aligned? And then finally, you know, as we've highlighted in this particular study, what, one of the things we need to do is not make this sort of the question that was asked before, which was a great question, is how do I begin to figure out this, this ecosystem, this network? You know, we need to understand better, you know, if you're in, in, in clean water, and you want to be in you know, sub-Saharan Africa, East Africa, what are the partnerships you know, that you're going to really need to go to scale? You know, we need to begin to understand this now so we can help the enterprise leaders do that. And, and that's something that, that I want to thank you know, Ibon for doing because they've really made an, an effort to, to help begin to crack that nut. And it'll take us a little while to figure it out, but these are the right questions in the direction we need to move as a community. And, and you know, I'll just put the, these up and, and stop here because you know, obviously we don't know all the answers. Um, but I think we're starting to ask better and better questions, which are m moving us to creating more tools and frameworks that are going to be helpful to enterprises in the development community with the ultimate goal of enhancing the likelihood of scale for all these enterprises. And these are just some of the other, you know, partnership things that we're thinking about trying to understand, you know, different geographies, really understanding the, the transition from pilot to scale, because I think that's a crucial transition point, what does that look like? And then finally turning this around and saying, well, you know, we have to make sure that when an enterprise looks around, that the right set of partners or the possible right set of partners is actually available. There aren't some big gaps in the ecosystem. So, you know, my last slide is just sort of the close that, that as we go ahead, you know, we need to better understand the lessons learned. We need to translate that into actionable strategies, frameworks, processes, processes that allow us to build not only better enterprises, but to to better optimize development sector support. So I'm going to stop there. It looks like we have about, I think, seven or eight minutes. So enough for, for some questions for sure. So thank you, Ted, for the presentation and uh, to ask some questions um, with respect to, to the last um, arguments you had. So you mentioned that building an ecosystem uh, is important even if other enterprises benefit from it. How about partnerships between enterprises to actually build those ecosystems together? Yeah. And this is, and I'll answer the question more formally in a second, but I think by asking these questions about partnerships, then we ask interesting questions about what kinds of partnerships, right? And that takes us the right way. Yeah, I mean, I think enterprises can partner together. I mean, I don't, I don't see, you know, the idea of competitors working together, um, although they can come together for some things like the platform the WBCSD has, where they can come together 
and advocate for policy change in certain sectors. And I think we can hopefully we'll see that more in inclusive business where they have a stronger platform to advocate for the things they need. You know, um, so I, I think they can work there. And I think that you know one you know more, you know an inclusive business doesn't have to work by itself and shouldn't. And I think all partnerships are on the table there, and certainly with other enterprises can be very powerful in many ways. We have one question um, regarding partnerships as well, um, specifically looking at partnerships uh, to the extent that they uh, essentially come together to reduce costs and increase revenue or increase yields in the field of uh, ag. Um, have you seen or thought about um, rather than investment partnerships, um, the sharing of costs of the saving and, and revenue increases between partners? Yeah. I mean, and this, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways of, of defining partnerships. And, and I think this idea of a shared platform becomes very powerful and it and extends beyond, um, you know, farm. But I think that's right. You know, if you have a, a way of being bringing produce in, if you can share those costs across different crops, across different partners, the same goes with, with last mile distribution. It, it's very expensive just to bring malaria medicine or just to bring bed nets. So if you can create a platform for distribution, and you're, again, you're starting to see that in some of these enterprises where they have entrepreneurs that have sort of baskets of goods. And I think that becomes a, a powerful model. And, it, and it, the same thing can become for, you know, creating standards across enterprises. So yes, there's a, there's a lot of power in working together and thinking about this idea of building a platform that multiple people use, recognizing, you know, along with that, that each enterprise still needs to be sure they, they, they are um, unique and have their own value proposition in some way too, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it's probably the idea of partnerships isn't new to anyone, but this idea of how to do it well in this space is what we need to understand. It's the old idea: all of, all organizations, all businesses, you know, have partnerships of, of some level. We're not reinventing the idea of partnerships, but it's it's the who and the how that I think are different here that we really need to understand. So talking about the who. Um, there is a very interesting question asking, um, we talked a lot about what enterprises can do, what the development corporation can do, so the question asks what or how can small-scale farmer groups actually identify potential partners? So really, um, yeah, turning the yeah. lens around. That's a great question, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and this is not something that I have looked at a lot. I mean, we, we have worked with a few enterprises and what, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn it around to the enterprise side, but I think this, this can apply to um, what they've tried to do is to think about cooperatives in a different way. And to rather than all the benefits go out to the cooperative members in some sort of an equal fashion, but certain people contribute to the cooperative in more ways, other than you know, someone they manage it, they do us. How do you equate more value to the people to do more work to maintain the cooperative? What does that mean? And then how do you actually, while you're building this, ensure maximum transparency, so that when you're creating an intermediary, everything's transparent on both sides, so everyone knows what's going on. So th there's a little bit about that. The answer to that is a little bit about it's maybe you know reinventing a cooperative. The challenge for individual farmers, you know. They have to find a way to, to, to aggregate in, in some fashion, and, and there are lots of ways of aggregating, but it's very difficult for an enterprise to deal with thousands and thousands of individual farmers. Um, it, the, the cost, you know, so how do you aggregate in, in some way? And I think that there's probably going to be some new and interesting ways of aggregation that we haven't thought about yet. And that's something the farmer groups may want to think about is what are the ways that we could aggregate that would create value for us as well as any potential partners so they'd be especially interested in working with us. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, there's one asking for a good example of a pilot activity that was designed with the scaling partner right in the beginning. Okay, that's a good question. I can think of you know, well, this is the challenge. You know, to, to be honest, we, we haven't seen a lot of scale, so this is sort of the, the, the biggest challenge. Um, you know, um, you know, DFID played an important role in supporting mobile money and PESA in Kenya, 
So it was really started, you know, together with the, the vision of creating something, you know, fundamentally new and different. I think that that's a reasonable example. Um, you know, ITC in India has worked very closely in it with some partners in identifying, um, you know, who they want to work with in a community and built some some metrics out mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, and I wish I could say that, that there were a lot of examples, but that's the right question. I don't have a lot of examples uh, yet, but that's where we need to go. Mm. And I think we will also hear a little bit more about uh, thinking about scaling from the beginning also in the next yeah. uh, webinar in September where we'll, we will really look at uh, not only from the partnership side but also from other, uh, from the planning side and from the designing side, how do you think about scaling right away? And I'm sure that uh, we will also have uh, some more examples at hand by then. I think that, I mean the question is is so good, and the the challenge is we just haven't had that much scale, so we are trying to make uh, understand things that haven't happened as much as we would like. So it becomes a little more challenging um, to do this, and that you know, and I think that we're going to learn a lot about that that very question as we go forward. Um, I have two more questions on the screen. Um, I think I'd put the one on uh, well. Uh, does the business model define the ecosystem? That's the first part of the question. Um, if so, will IBAN or, or the WDI provide consultancy towards defining the ecosystem for each distinct sector? Mm -hmm. right, and that is a, I think it really depends on how you def what you mean by the definition of an ecosystem. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand that, but the way I think about it is then an you know there, there's two different terms we've used for ecosystem. One is the partners that the enterprise builds around it, but there's also the market ecosystem in which it exists. And I'm not quite sure which one it is, but what if you think about the partnership ecosystem, that is something that we're going to spend some time trying to help enterprises understand better how to build. And then the 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 market ecosystem, um, that's something that also needs to be built. And that that may you know. That may lie more broadly with the development community, and we certainly work with them to think about what is it, what is missing in the market ecosystem that needs to be in place to facilitate enterprise development. And I don't think of it as 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 you know, buildings, maybe more enhancing or shaping or or adding or um, you know, find, you know, fit, and the question for the development community in this in this situation is, I can't invest in everything. Where will my investments have the biggest impact? Where will I get the biggest bang for the buck? Um, and I think that's an important question for them to address. Um, I get a few questions now asking if um, the participants will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, I take that chance to um, say that we will share um, the presentation plus some other material right after the webinar, including the report um, that, was pre that, is, uh, that provides more information and uh, has some deep dives. Um, we will write an email from Iban and with Business Council side uh, and Ted to really share some more information, I think also based on the questions. Um, I've seen a few questions really about smallholder farmers and agribusiness. Um, we have some material there and we will also be able to uh, redirect you to some uh, sources of knowledge and sources of, uh, of uh, interesting resources that you can look at um, to deep dive into the agribusiness, smallholder farmer issues. Um, I think we covered, there's one last question um, that was asking, <clears throat> or that was saying civil society organization um, uh, find it easier due to the funding to, to uh, think about partnerships, while as you were saying corporates um, are a little bit more hesitant um, to think about it and to partner with each other, um, depending or due to many reasons. Um, so what could be the, or what is the approach to um, build corporate partnerships for inclusive growth? How do we get to that point? So how do we get corporations to be able to, to build more partners? I think so. Oh, I think if yeah. to think about it, how can we push yeah. them that way? I mean, there is, there's a couple of things. I mean, one of them uh, that we've talked about is, is actually having someone on the team that's really focused on doing this, I think. And another part is really recognizing, and this is an internal challenge, the value of having a partnership. Because, you know, there's a, 
corporations to some degree like to own as much as they can and and to control as much as they can for, for many good reasons in the developed world. In, 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 in top of the pyramid, middle of the pyramid markets, in low income markets it's harder to do that. And there has to be a little bit of a mindset of, it's a term I use in, in, in this book I mentioned, um, this idea of thinking about becoming more interdependent in their collaborations. And that allows the development community to feel more engaged and more able to support a company. Um, because the, the company has a sense of what they need to deliver to a, for the development community to achieve their goal, the nonprofit goals. Um, because the development community is not necessarily interested in how much money you make. They want to know the impact. But they're not mutually exclusive. They're actually very well connected. People only buy things that have a positive impact on their life. Presumably. So, um, so you know, I, I think it's really committing yourself to saying we need to think about these as partners and partnerships of, of equals. Different skills, different values, but of equals. They're not, you know, some weirdos in the corner that, that are, you know, eating granola. They're very smart, dedicated people who know a lot about their sector and, and are, are you know, some of the, the brightest people on the planet. How do we engage them on a level playing field and get them to understand how we can create value for them. Exactly. And with the report and the presentation today, you gave us very useful insights, or to all of us, insights and uh, expertise on how to really reflect on our own organizations uh, or enterprises' partnerships and how to really build up a partnership ecosystem framework. So I hope we answered, uh, or we answered I most of the questions. No, um, yeah, as David already said, um, we will provide you with the report, the presentation, the recording um, after the webinar. And I really want to say we are happy, delighted to jointly um, have this webinar to have Ted London here and uh, share about uh, the findings and the reports and to give us really input on for our own thinking and reflection for the future. Thank you very much, Ted. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you all for wherever you are, um, whatever time of day it is, for, for spending an hour together. And I hope that um, you know, even if you don't have all the answers to the questions, you, you've got a sense of how to begin to address them and, and to move forward. And, and I look forward to you know, hopefully continuing on this journey with all of you as we continue to do better and better. And I think our, our, our goals are the same as how can we build better enterprises that have real impact on the base of the pyramid. Okay, thank you, Ted. Um, as Mareike said, we will uh, contact you and provide you with more information, and we will provide the contact details um, in case you uh, you have further questions and uh, need further clarification. And um, we hope to see you all in September for the let's say the follow-up seminar. Uh, we will send you the information about the, the date and um, the system and everything. Um, send you some insight before that. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you. Thank you to all the participants, and um, see you next time, then in September. Bye-bye.